So we welcome you to the university. Some of you will be regular visitors. Many of you may not have been back here for a long time, but we hope that after today, you will come back many more times. We greatly value the relationship with our alumni. We're in contact with over 250,000 alumni of the university and its predecessors, many of them from across the world. A lot of them are now in very senior positions. Many of them contribute to the university, as I'm sure some of you do, and if so, thank you very much indeed, either by providing funding or your time. And quite a lot of alumni contribute to events such as, or activities such as the Manchester Leadership Programme. Some of our alumni do equally important things that may not be such high profile. And just to highlight one example, the winner of our Volunteer of the Year alumni this year was Estelle Goodwin, who set up a charity in Kiberia, which is a slum of Nairobi, doing remarkable things for children there. And I know many more of our alumni contribute in those sorts of ways. If you haven't already picked up a booklet, please do so, and please feel very welcome as part of the university and the university's family. When we select the lecturer for the Cockroft Rutherford Lecture, we look for several things. An outstanding scientist, because of course both Cockcroft and Rutherford were scientists. Somebody who is eminent and a great presenter. And we certainly have all of those today. And someone who is not only a member of our staff, but a member of our alumni. Brian Cox, of course, will be known to many of you. He was born in Chatterton, not so far from here. And he came here to study physics and gained a first class degree. He told me today it's exactly 20 years until he, since he came to the University of Manchester. He then made a brief excursion out of physics and into the music world. Some of you will be aware that he was in a band called Dare. And one of uh, our, our friends today came along with a CD from Dare asking it to be signed by Brian. One of very few copies, I understand. Perhaps even more well-known, he then joined Dee Ream, particularly famous for their song, Things Can Only Get Better, which of course was hijacked by the Labour Party as they came into power. So Brian can tell you he made tea with John Prescott. Of course, Brian is now a professor of physics, a Royal Society University Research Fellow, noted for his research in particle physics, both here and at CERN, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about. Then again, he has another life, of course, as a popular television and radio star. Many of you will know his works on the Wonders series, Stargazing, filmed at Jodrell, Infinite Monkey Cage on the radio, and very much more. He's even the Sun's professor, so he does publish in the Sun. <laughs> I don't think that will count for the research excellence framework that we have to return to. <laughs> Brown's received many honours, including an OBE in 2011 and in the same year a Royal Te Television Society Best Presenter award, Presenter award. But in spite of all this fame, he's still a working physicist. He's still doing research in between television filming and writing books. And this coming autumn, he'll be giving a first year lecture series, which I think he'll mention to you. He also is an inspiration to many in the way he persuades government about the importance of science. He also values greatly communicating science and inspiring people, potential future scientists, non-scientists, and existing scientists. And today he's going to talk about that, about some of the barriers to communicating science and some of the great rewards. We're really delighted that Brown's here to give the Cockcroft Rutherford Lecture. Thank you, Brown. Thank you. Um, well, the title of my lecture is A Scientist in the Media, and I thought I'd begin by just playing a, a clip of the scientist that inspired me a long time ago, 1980, actually, Carl Sagan. Now, those of you who are uh, a similar age to me who are watching TV documentaries at this time will, will remember this very vividly. This is the, the opening of um, the first of 13 hours of television, a series called Cosmos. And I think it's interesting to watch from today's perspective. It may 
in some sense look a little dated, but in another sense, as I'm going to explain, I think it was part of a long tradition of a particular way of explaining science, of presenting science, of explaining the value of science, not just the economic value, and I'm going to mention a little bit about that later in the talk, but also the, the value to society, the, the overwhelming power of science, science as a foundation of our society. I think it's one of the things that Sagan expressed so eloquently. So I'll play this clip, it's about three minutes long, and then I'll say why, what I think is valuable about it and try to set it into a context. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Our contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the grandest of mysteries. The size and age of the cosmos are beyond ordinary human understanding. Lost somewhere between immensity and eternity is our tiny planetary home, the Earth. For the first time, we have the power to decide the fate of our planet and ourselves. This is a time of great danger, but our species is young and curious and brave. It shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. I believe our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. See, for me, I think one of the things that captured my imagination when I saw Sagan present science like that was that it's, well, there's two reasons. One is that it's part polemical. So um, you heard him say that it's a time of great danger. Sagan was very famous for being a, um, I suppose, a, a voice in the Cold War. This is the time of the Cold War when it looked more than any other time that we could destroy ourselves as civilization. And Sagan spoke very eloquently about the value of our civilization and why um, it would be obviously a disastrously stupid thing to do to destroy it. Um, so he brought polemic back into documentary. Um, I think that's interesting because th there's a strand of thought that thinks that television's documentary should be just the science. It should be like an old-fashioned horizon program where there's a deep voice that just narrates about the scientific facts. Sagan um, was very clear that science is much more important than that, actually. There's much more to the scientific endeavor than just the... the I suppose the exploration of the scientific universe, it's activity, and Sagan wasn't afraid to do that. The other thing I think is important, and the thing that really captured my imagination, was that he was, he had the, you can see it, so there's, there's a sense of wonder there, there's a sense of, um, that there's more to science, the, the, I suppose the idea that you should explore the universe is in itself the most valuable idea that we've had as a civilization. The spin-offs, which I would argue are the entire modern world, um, are in some sense just that. They're spin-offs from the scientific endeavor, exploration for the sake of exploration. 
that captured my imagination. And actually, it's, it's a very old way of looking at science. Although I think Sagan was one of the first to put that on television, to be overt about the emotional power of science. Um, when you look back in history, you find that that was one of the motivating factors for many of the great scientists. Um, I want to read you a little bit, uh, a couple of pages from this book, The Age of Wonder, which is by um, an author, Richard Holmes, who's most famous for his biographies of the Romantic poets. But he turned his attention to a particular period in British science between about 1750 and 1850, and he termed it The Age of Wonder. And I'd like to read to you why he gave it that name and why he, think it's, why he thinks it's important. So he writes that the first scientific revolution of the 17th century is familiarly, familiarly associated with the names of Newton, Hooke, Locke and Descartes and the almost simultaneous foundations of the Royal Society in London and the Academy of Sciences in Paris. Its existence has long, has long been accepted and the biographies of its leading figures are well known. But the second revolution was something different. The first person who referred to a second scientific resolution was probably the poet Coleridge in his Philosophical Lectures of 1819. It was inspired primarily by a sudden series of breakthroughs in the fields of astronomy and chemistry. It was a movement that grew out of 18th century Enlightenment rationalism, but largely transformed it by bringing a new imaginative intensity and excitement to scientific work. It was driven by a common ideal of intense, even reckless, personal commitment to discovery. It was also a movement of transition. It flourished for a relatively brief time, perhaps two generations, but produced long-lasting consequences, raising hopes and questions that are still with us today. Romantic science can be dated roughly, and certainly symbolically, between two celebrated voyages of exploration. They were Captain James Cook's first round-the-world expedition aboard the Endeavour, begun in 1768, and Charles Darwin's voyage to the Galapagos Islands aboard the Beagle, begun in 1831. This is the time I've called the Age of Wonder, and with any luck, we have not quite yet outgrown it. And, and then he goes on to just um, quote from Wordsworth, a, a beautiful poem that Wordsworth wrote. Wordsworth um, was at Cambridge, he looked out, and he used to look out over the quadrangle at a statue of Newton. Newton. And Holmes identifies this particular passage as really symbolizing this idea of science as a romantic pursuit, exploration for the sake of exploration. Wordsworth wrote, about that statue of Newton. And from my pillow, looking forth by light of moon or favoring stars, I could behold the antechapel where the statue stood of Newton, with his prism and his silent face, the marble index of a mind forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. Beautiful words, of course, by Wordsworth. But this sentiment, I think, that Holmes expresses so well in The Age of Wonder is that there always was much more to science than just utilitarian discovery. Uh, there was a, it was a romantic um, pastime, I suppose. Uh, uh, as, as I said, exploration for exploration's sake. And I think, I just flicked that picture up of uh, Faraday there giving lectures at the Royal Institution. Um, Faraday was one at the tail end of that age of wonder, but still, interestingly, if you know the Royal Institution, it's on Albemarle Street in London, which was the first one-way street in the world. Why? Because so many people brought their horses and carriages to come to the lectures, the popular science lectures at the Royal Institution, that the street was constantly blocked. And so we are responsible for traffic regulations in some sense. Um, but it just shows that th this idea that, that um, science communication, as it's called today, is some kind of modern phenomena, is, is entirely wrong. The, these, these scientists back in 1750, 1760, all the way through to Faraday and beyond, felt that it was an integral part of their profession to deliver the sense of excitement, I suppose, about science, um, irrespective of how utilitarian it may be. Um, Humphrey Davy, actually, who discovered Faraday, also expressed this beautifully um, in one of these lectures at the Royal Institution. He said, nothing is more fatal to the progress of the human mind than to presume that our views of science are ultimate, that our triumphs are complete, that there are no mysteries in nature, and there are no new worlds to conquer. Again, poetic and idealistic words. And I think that's been carried on to a large extent um, today. If you look at CERN, I want to talk a little bit about the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. 
then it's very much in this tradition. Even if you look back at its founding document, CERN was founded in 1954, out of the, the ashes, I suppose, of the Second World War. It was one of the, Europe's great projects. And it was founded, as it says, in its charter, well, here it is. The organization shall provide for collaboration among European states in nuclear research of a pure scientific and fundamental character. The organization shall have no concern with work for military requirements, and the results of its experimental and theoretical work shall be published or otherwise made generally available. Now, today, um, CERN is still operating according to those principles. It's now a completely worldwide endeavor. This is a list of the countries that are involved, the member states, which are um, all European, but observer states and non-member states. And if you look at those lists, you see countries collaborating together in the name of scientific research, which you would never imagine would collaborate on anything else. There's countries such as Iran, Pakistan, Israel, the United States. Um, countries that collaborate nowhere else in the world, but collaborate at CERN to explore the universe. And so what does CERN do? Well, of course, the Large Hadron Collider is there. It's a machine, it's the most complicated machine ever built by many measures. It was the largest civil engineering project in Europe when its tunnel was dug between 1983 and 1988. And its job is to explore the universe according to CERN's charter because we're interested in how the universe works. Um, this machine accelerates protons, so the nuclei of hydrogen, to 99.999999% the speed of light. It accelerates them around when they're going at full speed. They travel around that ring 11,000 times a second. There are two beams of them, one going one way, one going the other way. They're compressed into something which is the, di di the diameter of a human hair. They're crossed, and in those collisions, in every proton-proton collision that's generated there, up to 600 million every second, by the way, we recreate the conditions that were present less than a billionth of a second after the universe began. Why do we do that? Purely because we want to know how the universe works. Um, this is a picture of the inside of the machine. This is the accelerator technology pioneered, I should say, by Sir John Cockroft and others. So it's a technology that was pioneered here in Manchester. Um, today, it's <laughs> industrial scale engineering. This tunnel is as big as the tunnel of a, of a London underground train. Those are the two beam pipes in which those beams circulate. Um, so a tremendous engineering achievement. I could say, actually, this whole thing runs at a temperature less than minus 271 degrees Celsius, which is 1.9 degrees above absolute zero, which is colder than the universe. So a lot of people say that if it wasn't for a technological civilization like ours, there would be nowhere as cold as that in the universe. It's hotter than the universe, uh, colder than the universe, a remarkable engineering achievement. And as I said, its job is to create the conditions that were present a billionth of a second after the universe began. Why? Well, we found over a century of experimentation, arguably beginning here in Manchester with Rutherford, um, that as you go back in time, so you go hotter and hotter and hotter, which means to smaller and smaller distances, higher and higher energies, the universe gets simpler and simpler and simpler. So if you look at the universe as it was when it was very hot and very dense, it turns out it was very simple, relatively easy to understand. And then as the universe expanded and cooled, complexity crystallized out. So in a very real sense, we, human beings, stars and planets and galaxies, are properties of an old and cold universe. If you rewind time and go hotter and hotter, the universe gets simpler. I think a, a, a beautiful analogy is to think of a snowflake in the palm of your hand, which is a very complex structure. Every snowflake is different, but as the heat of your hand heats the snowflake up, the snowflake melts into a pool of water, and you see that Underneath, it was nothing more complex than H2O, molecules of hydrogen and oxygen. Well, in a very similar sense, experimentally, we found that's true of the universe. So the reason we are running CERN is to see if we can understand the fundamental laws that govern the universe, because in those conditions, it's easier to tease them out. They're not obscured by this crystallized complexity. Now, science has always had a double-edged reputation, I suppose. In, in Richard Holmes's book, he mentions this. He points to paintings like this. This was painted back in the 
1840s, I think, by Joseph Wright of Derby. It's a very famous painting, one of a series of famous paintings. This is called A, a Bird in an Air Pump. Uh, you see there's a bird there. And it's supposed to depict the wonder, but also the terror of discovery and science. It was very current in the society then. It led through, through the Romantic poets, actually, to Mary Shelley, and then onwards to Frankenstein. So it's this idea that exploring the universe is potentially a dangerous pursuit, lyrically and beautifully expressed by Joseph Wright. Today, we have the same thing. Um, <laughs> it may be that we've regressed slightly aesthetically, but um, the, the same sentiments are there. And this is an expression of one of the first one of the challenges we met at CERN. So the story that we'd always assumed we'd be telling at CERN um, was of this tremendous machine that was exploring the fundamental building blocks of the universe. But there have always been two um, public issues with CERN. One is this, are we all going to die next Wednesday? Something that took us by surprise, because I think we had no idea how anyone could think that bumping protons together would cause any problem. Um, my favorite response to this was uh, by Gizmodo, a website who printed this, CERN to morons, <laughs> Large Hadron Collider won't destroy Earth, morons. And then what I quite like is because the morons might not be able to read, there's a diagram of, of uh, uh, no, Turn it on, Bob, it says there, <laughs> not ah, like that. Um, in some sense, we didn't help ourselves, which is one of the lessons press officers can get. James Gillis, who's a very good friend of mine, an excellent press officer at CERN, issued this statement, which said, the, he pointed out the planet hasn't been destroyed yet. <laughs> so you're going to be slightly careful with your words. Another friend of mine, Greg Landsberg, who's a, a really po a popular physicist in America, said, um, it's quite hard to destroy the Earth. <laughs> There's almost a deep laugh, the ha, 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 you know. Um, I said that, I took the more direct approach. Um, <laughs> it's actually genuinely true. Um, the, actually, and it's interesting that the reason we know that, by the way, so you might say, well, yes, but you've never collided protons together at these energies. How do you know? Well, um, this is one of the two graphs I want to show tonight. So we know that there's no problem with colliding protons together at those energies because nature does it all the time. What this is, is a, a plot of cosmic ray collision. So cosmic rays are very high energy particles that are hitting the Earth all the time from space. The highest energy ones, actually, um, we don't understand in that we don't know the origin. A galaxy is not a big enough particle accelerator to produce these energies. There have been single particles measured with the energy of a tennis serve. So imagine a tennis ball hitting you. If, um, Pete Sampras or someone serves it at your head. There are single particles that hit the Earth with that energy. It's quite remarkable. They're, they're up here. Um, so this is a plot of the energy of observed cosmic rays hitting the Earth, um, and this is the number of them. And this is the LHC energy, this, this red line here, so going up there. And this is what's called a logarithmic scale. Every division as you go up, a factor of 10, a factor of 100, a factor of 1,000. So by the time you get to here, you're talking about energies you know, around a million times in excess of the LHC collision energy, and those sort of cosmic rays are common. So we know that nothing interesting or untoward happens happens in particle collisions because we've done the experiment. Nature's done the experiment for us. And the reason, by the way, we don't use those to do a lot of the physics at the LHC is that they're hitting all over the Earth. And so if you build a little cosmic ray detector on the ground, you don't get very many high energy ones. Whereas the LHC, as I mentioned, can generate 600 million of these collisions a second in a very small space so we can observe them. But we're actually not very good at accelerating particles compared to nature. So that's how you know. I told the Daily Mail that and they didn't worry about it. <laughs> so th those are two arguments you have to face when you're arguing about the beauty and the power of fundamental research. It's very common to point out the dangers. It's very common to point out the cost. I think neither of them are particularly sensible arguments. Um, just to give you an example of how I learn to deal with some of this. I'm going to show you two videos now. One is of me on Newsnight arguing this case. But first, I just want to show you a little clip. Um, before I went on Newsnight, I knew I was going on at the, on the day the LHC was turned on. And I knew that um, a man called Sir David King, who a, was scientific advisor to the government, was going to come on. And I knew that he was a, a very firm advocate of closing down um, research such as CERN, because in his view, there's a limited pot of money and 
therefore it will be better directed into other more productive areas. Uh, as I've argued, and I'll argue again in this talk, I think that science doesn't proceed like that. I think science is the exploration of the universe and the benefits flow from that um, noble goal. However, I knew David King was going to argue with me. Um, a friend of mine who's a comedian and satirist called Chris Morris, who some of you may have heard of, it's a very famous television program it's called Brass Eye, um, sent me a clip of him being an interviewer. Um, this is satire, by the way. So the interviewee who happens to be Peter Tatchell, in fact, the, the gay rights campaigner, but that's got nothing to do with the, the point. The point is that he sent me this and said, do this, right? When someone starts saying something you don't like, or even if you want to unnerve them a little bit, then face work is very important. He said, it's the look on your face. Because what will happen is that the camera will go to you, and you'll be on camera looking astonished, disgusted, or whatever it is. The person who's talking to you will get very disconcerted and then you can jump in and make your point. <laughs> Brilliant. So I'm going to show you the clip that Chris sent me first. You'll see his face work, which is immaculate, and then you'll see me do exactly the same thing <laughs> on Newsnight about two days later. So this is Chris first. The problem is everybody's too scared to do it by themselves. You get six, seven, eight, nine, ten MPs all coming out at once. None of them will be picked on individually. <laughs> They'll all be able to... Uh, have the mutual support and solidarity, hopefully, of their <laughs> colleagues. You get Jack Straw, Robin Cook, <laughs> Michael Howard. I mean, would there be an argument for them coming out they weren't gay at all? Well, that might be an interesting proposition. <laughs> so, so you see Chris's face work. So now watch for my perfect impression of Chris Morris. <laughs> <laughs> and to David King. I also say that I, I'll, I'll just run it on a bit, the clip. I do it twice in the clip. But also, I, I, I make the case for what I think is the reason that we, we uh, are doing these kind of research. It's a possibility, isn't it? It is, but I think there's another argument. Um, brilliant people like this young man sitting next to me also need to be attracted into these other uh, uh, challenges that we're faced with, where the outcome... Uh can be directly I, I, productive. I've just explained that, so that we are... this is too attractive, just, is it? Spending no, no, all this money no, makes it too attractive. No, no, you don't work on one thing. I, for, for me, myself, I work at uh, the Cockroft Acceleration Institute up at the Daresbury Lab. All the scientists that work at CERN are also working on particle beam therapies for cancer because it's part of the same endeavour, it's part of the same expertise. So you can't, you can't say to people like me, for example, 20 years ago when I went into physics, well, why don't you just do this because it's rather useful. In fact, learning how the universe works is useful, is inspiring. And on this day, actually, the day when, for once, physics is part of culture, it's in the headlines at every newspaper, every news broadcast in the world. I don't think the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science should be pouring cold water on that on this day of all and days. Nor am I pouring cold water on it. I think this is an exciting experiment. I really am interested in the outcome, as interested as most other people. But I've got a real challenge here. At which point are we going to say, this particle physics uh, machine, this accelerator, is as big as we want to build. Or do we... It, no, it there's be. a very real it, it question. It may be. There. It depends what you discover where, when and where you go next. Right. It, the po at this point now, and, and we've what? reached a, a, a problem. We've got a door that's closed in our understanding of the All way right. the world works. This machine has been built to answer that question. We're going to have to leave it there, sadly, but thank you both very much for joining <laughs> I mean, us. <laughs> I, mean, I just wanted to... Yeah. I, I wanted to show you that. There's actually a serious point there, although it's quite funny to see David there do that. Uh, actually, afterwards, I, I kind of made, made friends with David since, and I had dinner with him. And uh, it, w the point is that in order to function in arenas like that, particularly on news nights, you've, you've got to know exactly what you want to say, and you've got to know how to say it. It's not enough. And often scientists... Um, uh, myself included, wish this were the case, that just by presenting the argument, you would, you would win. D that there are facts, and there it is. You can lay it out, and that's fine. But actually, it turns out that's not the way. That there, there are techniques that you need to learn in order to get your point across, and that is one of them, to use face work. Um, but actually, David said to me later, we had dinner, and he said, he said, science needs people like you, Brian, because it needs people who are comfortable on television and therefore can appear to win an argument even when they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, that's, that's as near as a compliment you get <laughs> from Sir David. Um, so, 
let, I mentioned there, just at the end of that clip there, that CERN, what, what it's doing is, is trying to open a door, I think was a phrase I used. In other words, the search for the Higgs particle is not the search for a particle because we like searching for particles. It really is genuinely um, the key to a deeper understanding of nature. It is a closed door in our understanding. How so? Why is it that? Well, as of now, so as of on the eve of the new results that are, are going to be released from the LHC in July and the, the tantalizing, interesting results that were released last summer, but as of now, this is what we know of the fundamental building blocks of the universe. So we know that there are essentially four particles that make up everything in this room and everything in the solar system and everything we can see in the night sky, which are these four here, the up and down quarks, which make up protons and neutrons, which make up the atomic nuclei, uh, the electron, which goes around the nucleus to make atoms and molecules, and then this particle, which is called the electron neutrino, which is perhaps unfamiliar, but is in, in, intimately involved in the way that the sun shines. I mean, actually, such is the... Uh, intimacy of that relationship, that there are 60 billion neutrinos per centimeter squared per second passing through the Earth, so passing through your head now as a result of the nuclear fusion reactions in the sun. So although they're unfamiliar, there's a lot of them. Uh, they don't interact very strongly with ordinary matter, which is why you're not getting a headache from that process. But that's it. So that, those are the four that you need to build a universe. Experimentally, we found that nature chose to make two carbon copies of that set of four. So these particles here and these particles here, they're identical in every way to the first four, except they're heavier. And why that is, we don't know. We have no idea why that pattern exists. We have very good evidence there isn't a fourth generation. So that seems to be a complete set of the matter particles that you need to build a universe. Um, and that's it. They're held together by four forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism and the weak and strong nuclear forces, and that's it. So that's the complete picture of the universe that we know of at the moment. And if we exclude gravity for a while, because that we don't understand how that fits into this picture, but everything else, so all the matter particles that make up everything we can see, all the forces that hold those matter particles together, so every phenomena in the universe other than gravity is explained by a single theory called the standard model of particle physics. That's it. I don't need to say any more at that point. Um, actually, it is remarkable because it's a single equation that encodes, encompasses everything we know about, everything in the universe other than gravity. It is one of the great achievements of 20th century science, but it includes a particle that has not yet been discovered, and that's the Higgs particle. And for about two minutes, I'd like to just explain how that prediction came to be. How do you predict a new particle that you've yet to see? Well, if you take that equation and take all the forces of nature out, so let's say we, we want to write down the equation for how two electrons, non-interacting electrons, behave. So we wipe out electric charge, we sit them there, and they don't do anything. So this equation is just essentially describing the kinetic energy of those things, how they move around and how they don't interact with each other. Now, back in the 1920s, at the birth of quantum theory, it was known that when you write down the mathematical object that represents an electron, there's some freedom in a mathematical sense in the description. And it's very analogous to a little clock face, a little clock hand. So there's a mathematical object. It's called a phase if you're a, a scientist or a mathematician. But it doesn't matter. It behaves like a clock hand. And you can rotate it around like that just like a clock hand. And as long as you rotate all the clock hands together in parallel, so together with each one, two, three, all around like that, then there is no difference in the predictions of the mathematics. So that equation is um, immune to the position of the clock hands as long as you rotate them all, which is just kind of an observation. And it was made, it was obvious, it was made back in the 1920s. The question was asked, though, for cu reasons of curiosity. What happens if I want to turn the clock hands independently? I don't want to move them all at once. I want to just be able to adjust this degree of freedom. It seems I should be able to do that because it makes no observational difference, except that it turns out that it did, and it broke the theory. So you, you're allowed to move them all at any position you want as long as you do it in parallel, but if you move them all around like that, the theory breaks. So the question was asked, what do I need to do to that theory of non-interacting particles to fix that? I want to, it's called local gauge invariance of the technical 
mathematical term, but basically it just says, I think I should be able to move all these little mathematical knobs at random, and I don't think it should make any difference. So you can do that, you can fix it, and you fix it like that, and that is precisely what I had on the previous page. In other words, the forces of nature, three of them, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, enter the theory. They're prescribed to a very high degree by requiring that these little clock hands can just be moved around in different directions, which is quite profound. It's an interesting observation. It's a mathematical observation. So what we're saying is that there's a reason the forces of nature have the form that they do. And it's to do with this thing, it's called gauge invariance. It's a technical term, but the principle is quite simple. The point I want to get across is that there's an aesthetic judgment being made about the way the universe works. This mathematics must behave in a certain way. What happens if I fix everything up? I end up with a essentially deriving the form of three of the four fundamental forces of nature. So it's important and interesting, except that it was known back in the 1960s that that doesn't quite work. It works if all particles in the universe are massless. But as soon as you introduce mass for particles, it breaks again, and the, that beautiful aesthetic structure breaks down and doesn't work. So Peter Higgs and collaborators back in the 1960s tried to fix that problem. Can it be that we can restore this nicety to the forces of nature, the mathematical nicety? Well, you can, and that's to add the other two lines of that equation, which are all concerned with the Higgs mechanism, so-called Higgs particles. So what happens in words is that the universe is full of a field called the Higgs field. So you can imagine, if you want, Higgs particles popping in and out of the vacuum. It's like a condensate of particles sitting in the vacuum of space everywhere. And all the particles that you're made of, fundamentally, the quarks and the electrons are getting their mass from interacting with that Higgs field. From, you can think of it as them bumping into the Higgs particles in the vacuum and bouncing off them. And the more they bounce, the more mass they get. It turns out that rather esoteric mechanism allows all our beautiful mathematical symmetries to be protected. It's a very aesthetic appealing theory and so what you have to do is you have to find those Higgs particles. We've been searching for now well nearly 50 years for those but the LHC is the first machine that has so much energy that it will either find them or show that that is wrong and that's what we're on the verge of now. So I, I wanted to show you that it's a bit technical but I hope you get the sense that this Higgs particle is not just another random thing it is intimately built into our best description of the way that nature works at a fundamental level. That is our theory for everything other than gravity in the universe, and it contains Higgs particles. Um, now, just one last graph. You may have heard last year that there were hints of the Higgs particle. Um, there were hints. They weren't statistically significant. And what I mean by that is this is, a, this is a plot, and it's this point you should be looking at. That says that there were three uh, collisions in which it looked like there were Higgs particles made. Three out of millions and millions and millions over an expectation of about a half, so less than one. So that is one example of a, a, a signal, a Higgs signal, which is not significant enough yet to be said to be a discovery, but that was made last year. Now, the LHC is running beautifully with more than double the amount of data available. So it may be, and I don't know um, exactly, I know what my experiments got, I don't know what the other experiments at CERN have got, but there'll be announcements in July that will update this with twice or more the number of collisions. So. It'll be interesting. We're closing in on this fundamental property of the universe. And just to finish that, I think it's remarkable that you have a theory, quantum theory, that started in the 1920s, or arguably, actually, back in Manchester with the discovery of the nucleus back in the early part of the 20th century by Ernest Rutherford. Um, it makes predictions. The mathematics gets complicated but elegant. We believe those predictions. We build the most complex machine in the world, and we look to see if those predictions are right. It will be one of the great achievements in the history of science if it turns out that that esoteric mechanism I just described actually turns out to be the way the universe works. It's quite a remarkable moment, I think. So, um, 
Yeah, <laughs> in the last few minutes, I'm in danger of going over a little bit, but I want to play you this. Um, my science career started on television started by being interviewed um, by the BBC when I was working at CERN, and then I was asked to make a horizon, um, which is the way, uh, the route in for a lot of people, actually. I think it was the same for Ian Stewart, the same for Alice Roberts, same for Jim Al-Khalili, all working academics who were interviewed and then given a, a series to try them out, a program to try them out. Um, my first one attracted the attention of Harry Hill. So I thought rather than play a clip of my program, I'll play the clip of Harry Hill, Hill taking the piss out of me, essentially, um, because it's funnier. So. On the horizon this week, <laughs> Professor of Physics Brian Cox posed this question. I'm going to try and answer one of the simplest questions you could ask. What time is it? About five to seven. <laughs> this is truly the unknown. What time is it? I don't know. Get yourself a watch, Brian. <laughs> Learn to tell the time, you're pretty much there. But no, for Brian, there's more to it than that. So the answer to the question, what time is it, is... About time you got yourself a watch. <laughs> See, Brian reckons that to understand what time it is, you have to go microscopic. To know what time it is, you have to stop looking into the sky and looking at the stars and the planets, and you have to look down into the world of the small. Or at a watch. <laughs> See, I'm wondering whether he's overthinking the whole thing. He's making it overcomplicated and worrying too much about the answer. We might not be in a position at, at this moment in time with our current understanding of nature to even understand what it is that we're asking. OK, calm down. <laughs> Deep breath. Take some work back. We want to know what time it is at the moment. I can't even tell you at the moment what at the moment means. <laughs> when you got the job of Professor of Particle Physics at Manchester University, did you have to do any sort of test? <laughs> Perhaps it's me oversimplifying it. Have a go at explaining it to me again. Every event is, is a grain. As one event happens, like one grain of sand, then another one can happen on top of it, and another one on top of it, and another one on top of it, and you build up the... the the future, if you want, you build up the universe as, as, as layers and layers of these grains. Yeah, but that's the answer to the question, how do you build a sandcastle? Yeah, it's one of the occupational hazards, I think, of, of being on television that will happen to you. It happened to me sooner than I thought, <laughs> like the first thing that I did, but there we are. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Um, I'm going to just skip forward because I don't want to keep you too long through a couple of things. What I want to show you is a couple of clips from uh, my new series, Wonders of Life. Um, and this is a still from that series. So we finished filming this actually last Thursday in Madagascar. Um, it's, it's five hours for the BBC that's gonna be on in the autumn. Um, I had to become, I had to learn biology essentially for this series. The idea for the series is it's a physicist take on biology and I actually um, worked a lot with um, some people here at Manchester including a professor called Matthew Cobb who's a superb, gave me a superb year-long intensive course essentially in biology to make this series. It's an interesting challenge because um, I think more than any other series that I've done it touches on cultural issues which I genuinely chose to ignore in, in making the series because I don't think it's relevant but we are talking about things like the origin of life there is a program specifically on evolution and as, as Richard Dawkins calls it and I call it in the in the in the film, the, the law of natural selection, I think it's beyond a theory now. It's a law of the universe in the way that gravitation is. So we know a great deal about the way that life began. We know a great deal about how life became complex um, from simple origins, or certainly how complex life evolved into the complexity that we see today. Um, so I wanted to play you two clips. One is um, a clip that I think best ex explains the, the approach we made, which is why would a physicist be making a series which is essentially about the natural world? And then I'll show you a clip with this, uh, my friend here, the three, I think it was eight week old line cup. But anyway, first of all, the clip that shows the approach to the series. In February 1943, the physicist Erwin Schrödinger gave a series of lectures in Dublin. Now, Schrödinger is almost certainly most famous for being one of the founders of quantum theory. But in these lectures, which he wrote up in this little book, 
he asked a very different question. What is life? And right up front on page one, he says precisely what it isn't. It isn't something mystical, says Schrodinger. There isn't some magical spark that animates life. Life is a process. It's the interaction between matter and energy described by the laws of physics and chemistry, the same laws that describe the falling of the rain or the shining of the stars. So, yes, yeah, so that's it. It's a fascinating book, actually. If you've never seen it, What is Life? It was written, as I say, in 1943. It predicted the existence of DNA, as Schrodinger called it, an aperiodic crystal, in the sense there must be a molecule that replicates and passes information on from generation to generation. Watson and Crick cite that as being one of the inspirations that led them 10 years later to discover DNA. It also deals with the interesting and complex question of how... Um, life fits in with thermodynamics in the sense that one of the fundamental laws of physics is that the universe tends from order to disorder. So how is it that in a universe that's tending towards more and more disorder, things like human brains emerge? So it's a fascinating book. Um, but let me just show you one other clip, which is the lion, because I, th this actually, th there's two reasons. One is it's a cute clip, but secondly, it shows the, in Wonders of Solar System, Wonders of the Universe, our challenge was to describe things that happen out there in space, and we chose to do that by using landscapes on Earth as an example. So you can, you can stand there, you can say, here's a, as my friend says, actually, Robin Ince always says, you can stand and point at the sky and look wistfully at it and say there's a volcano. But <laughs> you can use the backdrop um, to, to explain physical processes. In Wonders of Life, it's different. You can use the animals to explain the physics and the chemistry and the biology. And so this is an example of, uh, of that. Oh, before I do that, <laughs> let me just tell you about this. The last week we was filming in Madagascar and we filmed these things. These are lemurs called eye eyes, quite remarkable examples of evolution by natural selection. If you trace them back, and this is very recent work done on DNA, um, DNA sequencing that tells you very precisely when this species split from the other lemurs. So you follow the tree of life. Where's the node on that tree that leads to this thing called the eye eye? Turns out it's 40 million years ago. A very, in, in a sense, a very ancient animal. In a sense, its species has been around for that amount of time. It occupies the niche a woodpecker occupies here or in certain areas of the world. So it's got a very long finger, the central finger, which actually has 360 degree rotation. It's on a ball and socket joint, and it uses it to tap three times on the on the bar on, on tree trunks. It goes tap 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 tap. tap. Listens with its ears. Then, when it hears that there's a grub inside it, when it's hollow, it gnaws into the wood with its teeth, which uniquely among the primates regrow. So they're more like the teeth of a rodent. It then puts its long finger in, grabs the grub, and eats it. So it's the most remarkable example of a creature that's specialized, highly specialized, into one evolution niche, and I just wanted to show you that because it's the weirdest looking thing. <laughs> but that's a, that's a lemur, it's a primate. Um, but back to this, so I'll show you that clip now of uh, an example of how we use animals to talk about science. This, believe it or not, is the top predator in Africa. Or she will be when she's older. She's only about eight weeks old now. Now she, in some ways, has an easier time of it than the herbivores because she's eating ready-made meat, ready-made protein. Now proteins are the, the biologically active molecules in everything that's alive. They're long chains of molecules called amino acids which at their heart have a carbon molecule.
Now there are thousands and thousands of different proteins that make up her body. In her claws, which I can feel now, there's a protein called keratin. You can see that. And in her eyes, there's a protein called opsin, which is bound to a pigment. So the whole lot is called rhodopsin. And that protein tunes her vision to different colours. There are also proteins in her muscles. <laughs> Myosin and actin, which are the things that allow her to run away. I've got a few scratches now because of you. Because of your proteins. <laughs> so yeah, this line cub. So to finish, um, I want to go back to the, I suppose what's been the theme of my talk, which is to um, speak about how I think the, the best way to, not only to promote science, but actually to describe what science really is. I started with Carl Sagan um, and his wonderful introduction to Cosmos. And I want to end with Carl Sagan as well, um, because this spacecraft, which Carl Sagan worked on, it's called the Voyager spacecraft, is really took one of the most iconic pictures in the history of science, in the history of humanity. Um, it's a very famous spacecraft in the center. We're still in contact with it now. It was launched in 1977. Its mission was to go to Jupiter and Saturn. It was designed only to last two or three years to do that. It was known that there was a possibility of one of the spacecraft going on to Neptune and Uranus if it worked long enough. It did that, and then it carried on and on and on. And now 40 years later, over 40 years later, we're still in contact with that spacecraft. So 30 years later, I should say. So it's a remarkable engineering achievement. Uh, you may have seen it was in the news recently, Voyager 1, because it's reached the edge of the solar system as defined by the position where the sun's magnetic field meets the intergalactic magnetic field. It's transmitting, by the way, on it with a transmitter with the power of 18 watts, and yet we can speak to it. It is over, I think it's 18 light hours away now. So it takes light 18 hours to get there. An 18 watt transmitter, a tremendous thing. But it took an iconic picture. It took two, actually. It took many great pictures of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, but on its way out from the Earth-Moon system, if you could dim the lights a bit, um, in 1977, it took this picture, which was the first picture of the Earth-Moon system together, two fragile crescents again, the, against the blackness of space. But then Carl Sagan had the wonderful idea to turn the spacecraft round after it was on its way out of the solar system into interstellar space, when it was four billion miles away, actually, from its home planet, and took this picture, and if you could dim the lights a lot, so I can talk about this picture, because uh, you need to be able to see it. Can you dim the lights? Oh well. Can you see that little blob there? That's the Earth. It's called the pale blue dot picture. It's the Earth as seen from four billion miles away. It has no scientific value at all. It took Carl Sagan a long time to convince NASA to do it. But arguably, because of what Sagan saw in that picture, there it is, the Earth from four billion miles away. Because of what he saw in that picture and what he wrote about, it's become a tremendously valuable piece of cultural, um, it's a cultural object now. It's no longer a scientific object. And I wanted to finish by reading what Sagan powerfully and movingly wrote about this picture, because I think it really genuinely does sum up the real value of science, which is a something that we do because we want to explore, and something that gives us a perspective of our place in the universe, which is uniquely valuable, which only science could give us. So Sagan wrote this about that picture. Look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. 
The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. That was inspiring, influential, rewarding, entertaining, and I say a big thank you to the BBC for turning Brian into a biologist now. So <laughs> he's um, going to answer a few questions. We've got some roving microphones. Um, we won't have time for all of them. First one up. Can you wait for the microphone? Can I just say also while the microphone's going, we have an overspill theatre upstairs. If you stick with us for a few minutes, we will come up and Brian will answer some of your questions up there. This is Raphael, and I've been dying to ask him this question. Sorry. Have you ever been bothered by the sheer size of the universe in relation to our own size? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's likely infinite, actually, so you'd be very bothered if you were <laughs> bothered. Uh, no, um, and, and I think, and I think this is what Sagan's writing meant that I read out at the end. I, I think that the fact that we are undoubtedly rare, certainly intelligent civilizations, as far as we can tell, are rare. Maybe life isn't rare in the universe. Maybe there's life on Mars now. Maybe there's life on Jupiter's moon Europa now. But it'll be sim simple life. So we don't know how likely it is that complex things will develop, but it seems rare. But I think that confers value because to me, what rarity means is tremendous value. So it, it's the opposite for me. I think our insignificance comes, which is true, we are insignificant on a universal scale, but are we? Because we're extremely rare, which means that we are extremely valuable. Um, Sagan, actually, another great Sagan quote, he said that, um, he said, he said that these, these are the Voyager he was talking about, these things, these are the things that hydrogen atoms do when given 13.7 billion years, which I think is a beautiful way of looking at us. Thanks. Another question? One here. In the back, thank you. Um, I'm a physics teacher at um, a comprehensive high school in John Cockcroft's hometown. Given the local relevance, what advice would you give on how to excite the young people um, in particle physics and physics in general? I think, as I tried to say, I think it's to do, it's putting science in its context. Because when you put it in its context, as I, as I argued, the way that it was absolutely commonplace if you go back to the 1780s, 1800, 1850, it's, it's, a, it's an optimistic, pursuit it's a pursuit it's about exploration it's a to me that there are 
obviously the, the details matter and obviously as a teacher teaching students how to do mathematics and teaching them the processes of science is extremely important but I think that can go hand in hand with a, an appreciation that it's a romantic endeavor at heart and I think every scientist will tell you that I think if you think back there's a, there's a famous passage, a great book by E.O. Wilson called Consilience, the biologist, in which he says that for him, he called it the Ionian enchantment, actually, this moment when you just look at the universe and you look at nature and something captures your imagination. And I think for him it was ants, if I remember rightly. It was just, it was just watching the way that these little insects wandered around. And so it can be anything from astronomy to ants to anything. But the point is that everything you see Everything you notice, to me anyway, is it, that then you, you can use that as the hook, and then and then you, science is the way that you investigate it. It's very fair. I should stop babbling on, just answering your question. There's a very famous um, clip of a physicist called Richard Feynman, who makes a passionate defense against one of his friends, who's an artist, who says that you know you can't surely understand a rose, and he said that I don't understand how not understanding that this thing. It's colored because insects selected it to be colored. It's colored because of natural selection, but in a sense, artificial selection from insects, which raises questions like, do insects have an aesthetic sense? You know, how did that thing get that? What about the smell? What's the evolutionary pressure for it to smell beautifully? Yeah, all those things. He doesn't understand how knowing more about that rose makes it less beautiful. Of course, it makes it more beautiful. Um, and I think, so that's what I would say. Show them Feynman. Show them this great clip of Feynman. I think it was on the horizon back in the 1980s where he says that. So we've got a question from a future physicist or biologist, maybe. What happens if after um, you find the Higgs particle? It's a brilliant question, that. Um, <laughs> what, what happens if we find the Higgs? <laughs> the, the, the answer is that then you have to start making precision measurements of it because whilst we have a theory which predicts the existence of such things, there are actually lots of different ways that that can happen, lots of different theories. There are some theories, for example, that have five of them rather than one. So you've got to then start to understand it, understand how it behaves, investigate it in the same way that we investigated the electron over the last 100 years and learned a lot in doing so. So it's, it's the start of a, of a process. So if you're worried about having a job in particle physics, then you don't need to worry because you, you would easily be able to be a PhD student here at Manchester, hopefully studying the Higgs particle at CERN, without a doubt. So. <laughs> Christian down here at the front, and then we'll take one over there. We'll probably just a couple more, and then we'll go and see them upstairs. Hi. Uh, by the way, I love you. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> uh, I understand that, I think it was sometime in the 1900s, we were looking for two other boson particles, and we found them, fortunately. Yeah. But what happens if we don't find, or we find evidence that concludes that there is no Higgs boson? Yeah. It's, it's a, again, a good question. Actually, my most cited research paper is on physics without a Higgs at the LHC. So um, the, the point is that the standard model, as I wrote it down, so this is this piece of immaculately tested theory, um, that breaks down energies, technically, it's called 1.4 TV, which is a measure of energy. The LHC collides, its design collision energy is 14 TV. At the moment, it's operating at 10 it operated at eight last year, at seven actually last year. So, um, so the point is that we, we have, we're well in excess of the energy at which the theory breaks without a Higgs. So when you remove the Higgs, you know that there's new physics there. Right, you know that the physics you see in that energy domain is, is physics that you don't understand without a Higgs. So that's why the LHC was built at the energy that it is. So it's, it's in the, re the, the unknown region. So you have to see something. And that's the first time we've had a, an accelerator which has been beyond that energy where our theory breaks down. Okay, there was one over there towards, up this towards the back. Really want, he really wants to ask a question. Sorry, where? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well that one and that one and then... Sorry we can't take all the questions, but uh, <laughs> we'll do that one and then that one, and then we'll uh, give Brian a brief break. Yeah, thanks very much, Brian. Um, is there any evidence, back to the first question, that there uh, were other um, planets with life, but they have actually destroyed them in a way that potentially we could? Is there any evidence that there are? 
that there was life on these other planets, but in fact that life form has destroyed the, the planets no. in the way that we could? No, and actually it's, it's a good question. There's a, there's a thing called the Fermi paradox, which is usually, is it, and the physicist Enrico Fermi, Fermi has expressed this back in the 1930s, I think. Um, the, the point is that our, let's just take the Milky Way galaxy. There are something like 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. And very recently, we've been, we've been discovering planets around every star that we can survey. There are th we know of a thousand planets or more now around distant stars. So it looks like planetary systems are common. So uh, 400 billion, let's say 100 billion solar systems. Our galaxy has been around for over 11 billion years, 12 billion years. So the, the question is, if there were civilizations out there and they'd survived, they should have spread across the galaxy by now, or at least their artifacts, their self-replicating machines, their, their robots that can go and mine and, and rebuild themselves and exponentially um, reproduce to populate a galaxy. We're not far off doing that. And by far off, I mean you could give us 10,000 years um, but we'll be able, we know we can do that in principle. And then we will colonize the galaxy if we're still around. 10,000 years is the blink of an eye. There's been 11 billion years for those things to happen. So the question is, why don't we find artifacts of other civilizations? And the answer is, we don't know. Um, it could be that they're rare. It could be that civilizations destroy themselves before they get to that point. Um, it could be that civilizations don't explore, although that's hard to understand because exploration seems to be its the heart of science and the driving force behind civilization in the first place. So it's a very good question, actually, and the answer is we don't know. <laughs> so last question here. Uh, uh, first, um, I read your book, you know, Why E is Equal to MC Square. This is not a question, you know, and I still don't understand one, why yeah. e, is equal, e is Equal to MC Square. <laughs> I actually um, sent an email, which I haven't got a response from you yet. It does get rather <laughs> a lot. <laughs> actually, my question is, you know, why gravity is not fitting into the equation with the other forces, you know? A brilliant question. It's why is gravity not in the framework? Again, um, I mean, uh, the reason... Um, we don't know the answer to that question is because gravity is so weak. It is something like a million, 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 million times weaker than the other three forces of nature, which on that scale are of all the same strength. So you have three forces that are very strong, um, and then one force that is incredibly weak, is so weak that its, its effects, even at the scale of, you know, grains of sugar, or so, it, impossible to measure. Um, so, we don't know the answer to the question, why is gravity so weak? And it is tremendously difficult to do experiments with gravity. Um, so, gravity at the moment, for, it's eluded, a description, a combined description of gravity and other forces has eluded us from a mathematical sense. So, string theory is an attempt to do that. So, ma the mathematics is hard, but one of the reasons the mathematics seems to be hard, I think, is because there's no experimental signposting. We don't know. Our best theory of gravity is Einstein's theory of general relativity from 1915, which is a geometric theory. It's a theory that says that gravity is not really a force. It's, it's a result of space and time being curved by objects, energy, or mass. Um, so, and that's the best framework we have. And actually, interestingly, at Jodrell Bank, because that's part of this university, it's, it's worth mentioning that the, the highest precision tests of gravity are done by Jodrell Bank and its partner telescope in Australia, um, looking at a double pulsar system. So you've got a system there where there are two stars, which are stars collapsed to the, well, what, about 10 kilometers across, a star collapsed into the size of a city, spinning around thousands of times a second, orbiting another one doing the same thing. So space and time are curved all over the place in that violent place. And actually, remarkably, the predictions of Einstein's theory, a hundred-year-old theory, fit perfectly with the observation of that extreme physics. So no one's been able to find a problem with Einstein's theory, let alone find an experimental signpost to a new theory, which is a quantum theory of gravity. Okay, so just before we finally thank uh, Brown for our fantastic experience, just two comments to make. Firstly, there are drinks downstairs after the lecture. We'll be running upstairs to meet those there, and I believe tomorrow's going to, uh, Brown's going to be very busy in the media uh, launching this book. 
Oh, yeah. It's all right, I'll do it for you. Uh, Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw. He was very good, he hasn't mentioned it. The quantum universe, everything that can happen does happen. So the next one to buy. The paperback edition. Paperback edition. You've probably all got the hardback. Of course. So then. <laughs> and I'd now like to invite Andy Spinoza to come and uh, give the vote of thanks on behalf of the alumni. Andy is the past chair of the Alumni Association and has just been elected your representative, the alumni representative, on our Board of Governors. Andy. Thank you, Dame Nancy, for that introduction of hosting the Q&A. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, it's hardly news, is it? Most students can tell us that uh, being an eminent scientist doesn't make for uh, a great presenter automatically. But um, I'm sure you'd agree with me that in uh, Professor Brian Cox, um, the university's blessed, really, with a, a world-renowned uh, scientist who has a real gift for communicating. And... Um, I, know, I don't know if you know, he's done this lecture already uh, today, so I think we can add to those attributes a sort of impressive stamina as well. Um, and he's got more Q&A after this. But in this world of 24-hour news and um, Twitter and sound bites, um, I, I think it's a huge asset to the reputation of the university um, that you can engage with the media, Brian, with such uh, intelligence and passion. And uh, you're the reason everybody's here today for what I understand is the most popular uh, alumni event uh, there's, there's been at the university. Um, so today's event shows how the Alumni Association is going from strength to strength, uh, really under the uh, new chairman, uh, Janine Watson, who was, who was here earlier. And we'd urge you all to um, engage um, as much as you can with the association. There are, there are through the website um, and, and future events, there are refreshments afterwards. So the alumni team is around uh, if you wish to, uh, to speak to them. Um, of course, events like this don't happen without a lot of hard work. So uh, th thanks uh, go out to uh, all the staff from the Division of uh, Development Alumni Relations who have worked on this. Um, division, of course, is led by uh, Director Chris Cox and um, the new head of uh, alumni, um, Claire Kilner, who introduced herself earlier. Um, but finally, of course, I'd like to bring to a close uh, a truly memorable uh, Cockroft Rutherford uh, lecture this year by asking you to show your appreciation one more time for Professor Brian Cox. <laughs>